And so we've seen in most parts of Africa, uh, average family size, you know, very voluntary what they're ch choosing to do, come down quite substantially. Uh, so the only country where when you interview people they say they want, on average, more than six children now is Niger, which not surprisingly has the highest disease burden in all of, uh, of Africa. So I'm very optimistic that we can make progress on these things. Um, the thing that makes me impatient about this, though, is that the normal sort of market signals of what should we work on, what's a priority, don't cause us to prioritize this work. Uh, a good example of that is that substantially more money was spent on uh, drugs to eliminate baldness than drugs to eliminate malaria. And baldness is a bad problem. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it takes a while to get it. You can buy a hat. Hats aren't that expensive. Uh, you know, compared to malaria, that's literally killing over 800,000 children a year, and it's a, just a horrific burden in terms of what, what goes on in Africa altogether. So we need a little bit of you know, philanthropy, enlightened activism to get these priorities that people whose voice in the marketplace is unnaturally weak uh, to raise that up. I'm in no sense saying that you know, the capitalistic system and how it works you know, at its core that there's some alternative, but it has to be complemented by substantial amounts of enlightened governments, both in rich countries and in these countries themselves, and philanthropy that, that can be incredibly catalytic. So I'm quite optimistic uh, that we can make progress on this. Uh, my full-time work now is the foundation. Uh, as part of that, I get to uh, visit Africa quite a bit. I get to spend time with scientists talking about innovation. And innovation, I, I define that very broadly. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean a new piece of software. Uh, it can mean a bed net that doesn't tear apart after a couple of years because they use some uh, new fiber. It can mean a new seed uh, for somebody in the, the, who's uh, a, a, small, a farmer with a small piece of land that they're, they're just growing food for their family. It takes many different forms, and some of the innovations are about delivering uh, these products out into the developing world. That's often very difficult. You know, even just getting malaria medicines to always be available when people need them is, has been a real problem. Having techniques, for example, taking AIDS drugs that you need to take on a daily basis, the compliance issues have been very difficult. And so an innovation where you would, say, take an injection every 30 or 90 days would raise the survival rates of people on uh, uh, AIDS drug therapy, ARB therapy, quite substantially. And so you know, it's very different than what the rich world needs. The rich world doesn't care uh, that its vaccines have to be in refrigerators. It doesn't care that they're fairly expensive. Uh, but in the developing world, those are often huge barriers uh, to, getting, to getting things out. So really understanding the problem set and then being able to tap into all the brilliant uh, thinkers uh, to solve those problems really is, is, you know, there's real potential there and it's, it's moving pretty quickly. I'm going to mention three particular uh, innovations because these are ones that have just recently been rolled out and they're kind of uh, different uh, each in their own way. You can see that in some ways it's deep science and in some ways it's, it's pretty straightforward. As John mentioned, I, I get to Africa quite a bit. Last week was a really exciting trip because uh, both in terms of the health work and the agriculture work, I, I saw uh, new examples of, of good progress. The work we do is largely focused on health and agriculture. That is, it, those are the two, you could say, most basic elements of advancing a country. Getting a good education system, a good government, good infrastructure, those things are also uh, very important, and all these things tend to be very interrelated to each other. Uh, until you've gotten health to a certain level, no one's ever had significant economic development. So there are no examples where you didn't improve health, reduce the massive population growth, and you were able to get uh, things going. Now, you, that alone is not enough, uh, but it's, it's one of those critical factors. So the first example I want to talk about is the... Um, what's called a meningitis A vaccine. Uh, it's this little bottle right here. Uh, these vaccines, uh, meningitis vaccines, if you, they're used in the US even though the disease is not very prevalent. You get an in infection in your brain uh, and typically about 10% of people will die if they get this. 
And there's a part of Africa called the meningitis belt uh, where this happens on a, a fairly regular basis. Every two or three years, uh, there'll be a season that it comes across. And it's horrific because you know, the, people can see their kids getting it. By the time they get it, they're not able to treat them. 10% uh, die. About 20% are permanently, permanently disabled in an extremely visible way. And some of the remainder are, are damaged in a way that is a little less uh, evident. And so this is, when we came out with this vaccine, uh, it took about a decade of time working with a variety of innovators, uh, innovators in the United States. Uh, the actual manufacturer is a company in India called Serum, which is the highest volume vaccine manufacturer in the world. Uh, they're not the highest sales level vaccine manufacturer in the world because they make mostly inexpensive vaccines, like 12 cent uh, measles vaccines, but uh, they're very involved in, in doing low cost things. So we created this large partnership and this became the first vaccine uh, that was ever created specifically for Africa. So it's just targeted to the meningitis that was taking place there. That allowed it to be very inexpensive, allowed it to be a single dose vaccine. And so what's happened now is, you know, we've made the vaccine available and everybody in this band of countries we saw, the meningitis belt, will get the vaccine. So far about 50 million people have gotten the vaccine. It's incredible when we show up and say, okay, here's this meningitis vaccine, that the demand is very clear because people remember uh, the years where this comes and they have children around who are there and, and permanently affected the, uh, the rest of their life. And so it's, it's very cheap. The upfront R&D costs were uh, only about $30 million, and now the marginal cost is very low. And uh, properly applied, when we get it out across this entire belt, it actually should eradicate uh, that meningitis, meningitis A, from that part of Africa. Uh, at the very least, it will reduce the cases by over 90%. But if we do it really well, and because people demand the vaccine, we, we're optimistic about that, it will uh, get, get rid of that plague altogether. So it was you know, very complicated. Uh, some of the science of how you make this vaccine, make it cheap and all that, uh, is uh, very complex, very state of the art. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just keeping it cold. This has to be kept in a refrigerator. If it's out uh, more than three days in the warm, uh, then it, it simply isn't active anymore. And so they're having that cold chain organizing the events, letting people know when to come. And a lot of pieces have to come together, uh, but in, in fact, they did. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about uh, is uh, HIV and what's going on with that epidemic. And HIV is a very tough epidemic. That is, even as you educate people about it, uh, the amount of behavior change has been very, very modest. And so particularly in uh, the southern part of Africa, South Africa, Botswana, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, the disease has anywhere from a 15 to 20 percent prevalence. That is, uh, about a fifth to a sixth of all adults have a